Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Dutch Webinar Wednesday. Today's webinar on estrogen metabolism with Dr. Tara Scott. My name is Amy Paoletti and I'm a member of the Dutch Education and Marketing Team. And I'd like to thank everyone today for taking uh, time to be with us. First off, I'd like to invite any of you who have connected for this webinar and don't currently have an account with Precision Analytical, but would like to or like to test us out, to contact our team or go to our website and complete the Become a Provider form. We've got a ter terrific opening order offer for all new providers that work with us, receiving up to 50% off on up to five test kits. Just a, a couple housekeeping items here before we get Dr. Scott started. Um, we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. You can send any questions that you have in the questions section, which should be on the side panel of your screen. I do wanna let everyone know that if you miss anything, don't worry. We'll be sending the on-demand recording to all of you tomorrow, along with all the presentation slides. The Dutch test provides an excellent hormone information and picture for the health of your patient's estrogen metabolism. The breakdown and excretion of estrogens is an extremely complicated process and a wide range of factors can influence it. Metabolism of estrogens occur in several areas of the body. Unhealthy estrogen metabolism may have profound significance for disease and conditions in which estrogen plays a role. On today's webinar, Dr. Scott will review the phases of estrogen metabolism along with discussing the epigenetic effects on estrogen metabolism. And finally, review suboptimal estrogen detoxification and ways to improve. She'll also be sharing a couple cases with you. So let's get to the introduction of today's presenter. I've been fortunate in my long career in this niche world that we all work in to cross paths with Dr. Scott over the past 15 years, and I'm very honored to have her with us today. Dr. Scott has been in the front of an, of an audience since she was the president of speech team in high school. This evolved into educating the community on hormone therapy, having taught doctors in five continents about an integrative approach. She lectures around her community to raise awareness about wellness and preventative health for patients. Having watched people suffer for years with little relief after many visits to multiple healthcare providers, Dr. Scott knows how exhausting this can be for patients. She has lived it as a patient herself and seen the benefit of finding answers to the core issues. Speaking helps her reach more people in less time, help, helping them conquer chronic health issues. Dr. Scott's humor and analogies make complex health concepts easy for the audience to understand and put into action to enjoy optimal health. She's a mother of three college-aged children, which I find hard to believe, uh, running a half marathon in every state, traveling, and being active outside. So please welcome Dr. Scott today. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you to Precision Analytical for doing these webinars. I know as busy providers, it's really hard to get to conferences, especially now in the COVID days, but we're always searching for things that are gonna help us with our patients for those of us that are in the trenches. So when I started doing this, you know, 17 years ago, the, the free education from the testing companies was tremendously valuable. So thank you guys for being able to provide this for the practitioners. So as Amy mentioned, my start was OBGYN and I haven't delivered a baby, I think for six years, um, but that was where I got my start. I did the fellowship with A4M and I also got another board certification in integrative medicine. So this has been my focus specifically the last seven years since I opened my practice. And so today, what I'd like to do is just go over the basics of estrogen metabolism. And one of the reasons I think it's super important is because there were a lot of mistakes that I made before I knew how to do this. And so that's one of the reasons that some people take certain doses of estrogen and they're fine, and other person takes the same dose and have terrible side effects. So I'm really glad that we have the, the means now to look at this. So we're gonna look at the SNPs and see how they affect metabolism. And specifically, my interest is breast cancer because I feel like this is the key to identifying the high-risk patient who needs a closer follow-up. And then I'm gonna put a case study in here and show you how I like to use the Dutch test. So why is it so important? Like I said, 
with hormone therapy, it's really hard to get a randomized placebo-controlled trial, right? I mean, everybody knows that that is theoretically the most pure form of evidence, but how can we possibly randomize this woman who's 125 pounds, this woman who's 225 pounds, different SNPs, different estrone production, having the same hormone and metabolizing it differently. So we need to know how to kind of weed through this. So one woman might have a different weight, like I said, and different age, a different one woman has ovaries, doesn't have ovaries. And what I always learned when I was learning about hormones was the pharmacokinetics, which is what does the body do to the drug and pharmacodynamics, which what does the drug to the, do to the body? So I think these are important concepts when we think about prescribing really any medication, especially a hormone. So suppose I tell all my patients to drink two liters of water, and I say, that's the recommendation, everybody, two liters of water. Would that be a problem if one of my patients was a marathon runner in 80 degrees? Probably that's not enough water. If he says, well, she told me to stick to two liters of water, he probably is going to get dehydrated and maybe even get kidney failure. Or suppose my patient was a patient on dialysis who already had kidney failure. If I told them to drink two liters of water, then that would be really a problem. Now, is water the issue? Is water the thing that's dangerous and risky? Not necessarily, it's the amount, it's how much we give, and it's the clinical scenario of the patient. So that's kind of my theory on hormone therapy. Is estrogen the bad guy? Is progesterone the bad guy? Or is it the amount that we give and the clinical scenario of the patient, what they do with it? So that's why I think it's important to think about estrogen metabolism. So just as an aside, probably a lot of you guys know that, but my OBGYN roots make me go back to the slide where we talk about where do the hormones come from? So we know that in a menstrual cycle, when a woman is still cycling and has ovaries, that 95% of the estradiol comes from the developing follicle. And at the beginning of the cycle, with day one being the first day of full flow, we see estrogen dominant in the follicular phase and be produced. And after ovulation occurs, in the second half of the phase of the luteal phase, that's when progesterone is produced and needs to be dominant. So this balance between estrogen and progesterone is also important. And that's why we most commonly do the single day Dutch test in the luteal phase. So let's talk about what we do know for sure. Now, any of you that are OBGYNs out there, um, maybe raise your hand and put in the chat, I'm OB, so high five, OBGYN sisters or brothers. This was our endocrinology Bible in residency, Spiros, Clinical Gynecological Endocrinology. So we got to go with the basics. This is what we consider to be true. So what does Dr. Spiroff tell us? Well, he says estrogen causes proliferation. He says progesterone inhibits proliferation, a decline in DNA synthesis, and interferes with estrogen receptors. And he also says that estrogen stimulates many oncogenes that mediate estrogen-induced growth, and that actually progesterone antagonizes that action and suppresses transcription of oncogene. So clearly, we know they have different actions, so it's important to know their balance. Now, if we look at the stereogenic pathway, you probably have a love-hate relationship with this. We're concentrating in this bottom area right here. We know this overview is your adrenal gland, and we know that DHEA is produced in the adrenal gland, so that could be a source of estrogen. We know that the developing follicle produces estradiol. So this down here is what we call phase one and phase two, in of estrogen detoxification. So we know that the majority of it takes place in the liver, but potentially it could be taking place in other cells. So when we talk about estrogen, this is what I think when I think about estrogen. Sophia Vergara, I mean, look at her luscious hair and look at her curvy figure. I mean, that's estrogen to me. It promotes growth, body development, bone loss, slows bone loss. But what we have to remember is there are actually three types of estrogen and they're not all the same. We know there's estradiol coming from the developing follicle. We know that that's good for the heart and good for the bones. We know that there's estriol, which is a weak metabolite of estradiol and estrone. And that we know is really good for vaginal tissues and skin. And lastly, we know that there is estrone, which I hate to say it's bad because if some your body makes something, I hate to say it's the bad estrogen, 
but we have to be careful and keep tabs on that particular one because we know it stimulates the breast. So the three types of estrogen, estrone, when you go through menopause is actually predominant because the ovary is no longer producing it. So if your ovary is your monthly paycheck, when you retire and stop your periods, you're gonna live off of your 401k. Well, your 401k is what your adrenal gland produces and your adrenal gland produces DHEA, which converts to estrone. And thus that's the most common phase estrogen in postmenopausal. Now, estradiol, as I said, 95% of that comes from the developing follicle. If you're no longer ovulating, you can get estradiol in, uh, estrone can produce uh, estradiol. There is an enzyme between those. They can convert back and forth. And then estriol, we generally don't see that be very high except for in pregnancy uh, or if there's a problem with your metabolism. So like I said, androstene dione is a precursor via DHEA for estrone, estradiol is the ovary, and estriol is the metabolite. So I think of it this way. Now, I don't know if you guys watched Charmed. I actually didn't, but I love this, this uh, picture because I think of estrogen like three sisters. So think of this one. I would call Alyssa Milano estradiol. Okay, and so estradiol is your sister that is like the most athletic and the straight A student and just the good one. So that I think of estradiol and one of the metabolites too. And then look at this one. I can't, I think it's Holly, Holly Combs, Pete or something. She's like the weak one. Like she's like hiding behind Shannon Doherty's sh shadow. So if we call Shannon Doherty estrone and we call Holly Marie Combs estriol, she's a metabolite of estrone. And look at Shannon Dory, she's estrone. So she might be the good sister, whereas estriol is the different sister. She's just shy and she's more artsy. Well, estrone is kind of the sister that's not necessarily bad, but if you put her in the wrong cloud, she might wear all black, black eyeliner, be goth and smoke pot if she's around the wrong kids. So she has the potential to be a dangerous estrogen, but not necessarily if you keep her in the right environment. So those are important things to know about the three types of estrogen. Now, this is a study that was uh, published in Menopause in 2004, and I love this chart because it shows us, number one, that there's an alpha and beta receptor in every cell. We know that in the breast cancer arena, as soon as you get a breast cancer diagnosis, we think about your estrogen and progesterone receptors. So we can see that alpha and beta receptors have different affinities. So alpha we think of accelerates growth and beta is like putting on the brakes. So alpha would cause growth and beta would cause regulation. So if we look at al uh, alpha and beta estradiol, this is like the estradiol patch as a hundred and a hundred. So equal affinity to alpha and beta. If we look down here at estrone, it has a higher affinity to alpha compared to beta, five to one ratio. So it means that if you have estrone, it wants to promote growth specifically in the breast and the uterus where there's alpha receptors. Now, estriol is the weakest estrogen, but you can see it has a higher affinity to the beta receptor. So it's more gonna be protective and slow down the growth from either estrone or estradiol. So all of these estrogens are not equal and they have different receptor affinities and we need to keep track on the percentages, which is another reason why I love the Dutch test because it gives you that pie chart that shows you the percentages of the breakdown of these types of estrogen. Now, interestingly, look at tamoxifen, how low that receptor affinity is for alpha and beta compared to estrone. So a lot of times these women have a lot of estrone hanging around so I'm wondering how much of a blockage is that tamoxifen gonna actually do? But that's an aside. So the other problem is there's other sources of estrone. It's not just from your adrenal gland, it's also from your environment. So it could be preservatives, it could be chemicals. There's lots of other phytoestrogens or, or endocrine disruptors that act like estrogen in today's day and age that we have to be conscious of. Those are stimulating the, the estrogen. So here's your phases of detoxification. You've got phase one and phase two. These are cytochrome P450 in phase one. And so this is true for any detoxification, but specifically for estrogen, testosterone, it's going to be a similar de detoxification. So you guys will remember Dr. Uh, Jones's claw foot tub analogy. I love that analogy. The one that I also use is think about phase one being sweeping your floor. 
Okay, so you sweep your floor if you got a hardwood floor, and then right in the middle, you've got this intermediate metabolite. So you've got this pile of crumbs. Now, if you stop there, your floor is actually going to be dirtier than normal. So what's the next thing that you got to do? You got to mop your floor. So phase two, depending on what it is, whether it's sulfation, glucuronidation, in the, in the uh, example of estrogen, it's called methylation, and it's by COMPT, C-O-M-T, which we'll talk about. So phase two is mopping the floor. And then phase three would be estrogen uh, detoxification in the gut, which putting that mop in the mop water and cleaning it out and doing the whole thing again. Or like Dr. Jones said, you've got the drain, you've got the sewage for the clawfoot tub. All right, so two phases of estrogen detoxification. The other things we need to make sure is that we are supporting estrogen metabolism. So there's a lot of things that can induce or augment these enzymes, right? So you can be genetically coded to be fast or slow, which we'll talk about, but other things affect it like specific phytonutrients. There's just certain things that can help this go on and there's certain nutrient deficiencies that can cause it to be worse. Specific vitamins that support these enzymes are cofactors. Specific diets, we know that cruciferous vegetables help phase one, CYP1A2, we know that it increases that. And then we know that in the intestines would be phase three, estrogen detoxification. And specifically, in insulin resistance is not something that is good for estrogen detoxification, or really a lot of detoxification. So these are all the things that can influence the phase one, phase two, and sometimes phase three of estrogen metabolism. So this is a little bit of a complicated uh, slide, but um, I'll, I'll simplify it here. So first you have estrone. Here's that enzyme, that 17 beta HSD that I talked about, that estrone and estradiol can, it's a double arrow so they can go back and forth. And then we have the option of a sulfatase getting estrone out by estrone sulfate. Now, if we simplify it a little bit more, let's just take away, so here are the three halls. And the thing is, there are three pathways once you go into phase one detoxification. So one is 1A1. This would be the good green metabolite, okay? That's 1A1. Two is 3A4. That was originally, we used to do a 216, so that's where you get the 16 hydroxyl. We used to think that was necess that was potentially proliferative, and there's some data that shows that it might. Now, the most recent data shows that that 2 hydroxy uh, uh, ratio isn't really the best way to quantify estrogen uh, load. But what we do agree on is that this red pathway, this 1B1, is potentially harmful metabolites because you've got your four hydroxy, okay? And so that's phase one. And so we can augment these. So first of all, you might have genetically coded. Secondly, based on things that induce those enzymes, we can make those go faster or slower. So more simplified here, we have this first phase. If you start here, if you stop here, potentially, we don't know about 16 hydroxy, four hydroxy, we want it to go phase two out COMT, but if it doesn't, it goes down this way by peroxidase and forms a quinone, which can be carcinogenic. Now there's always a back door. There's one more chance for it to go out this GST, and that's one way it can be neutralized. Again, another thing that's great about the Dutch test is we actually get a glutathione metabolite. So we can see, we don't need to know your genetics at GST. We can see, is your body producing it? So another effective way. All right, so let's break down the metabolites. If we had to say good, we'd definitely say 2-hydroxy is a good one. It is a weak estrogen, has low hormone potency. So some of the, some of the references are listed there. So 2-hydroxy is thought to be anti-proliferative in the breast. So that's the green, okay? Methoxyestrogens are the deactivated forms, okay? So methoxyestrogen, once they're deactivated, the methylation prevents the biotransformation of these hydroxyestrogens, which are phase one, into quinone. We talked about those quinone being bad, and those are the ones that cause DNA damage. So methoxyestrogen also inhibits cell proliferation, right? So that's a good thing. We don't want proliferation in the breast. Okay, so what are the bad ones? That's the 4-hydroxy, 4-OH-E1, estrone. That can, if it goes down to the quinone, it can 
lead to the formation of a deep urinating addict. And there are some studies that have shown that women at high risk or with breast cancer actually had higher levels of these in their urine. And in some cancer preparations, they showed that the 4-hydroxyestradiol was actually four times higher than the 2-hydroxy. So not a lot of data in this area, but we do have some studies that, that do support this. The bad estrogen, we say that 16-hydroxy is because it's an intermediate and it was initially associated with proliferation. However, like I said, recent evidence has shown that maybe it's not as, uh, as, as stimulated for breast cancer, so that's why it's depicted in the blue. All right, so what are the things that can actually affect this detoxification? One, insecticides have found to inhibit CYP1A1. So remember, 1A1 is the, is the green. So if you're, involved, if you're exposed to a lot of pesticides and insecticides, that can inhibit the beneficial estrogen metabolite, right? Resveratrol. Resveratrol can be helpful in preventing the DNA addicts because it inhibits peroxidase activity. So peroxidase activity is the one after this comp right here. And so resveratrol inhibits the peroxidase activity and reduces the formation of those quidones. So that's something that is helpful to give if you have a high red pie graph or 4-hydroxyestrone. So something I like to give to my patients. The other thing that is helpful is NAC. And acetylcysteine. Now, and acetylcysteine is a precursor to glutathione, and it also has been shown to lower urinary DNA addicts. All right, iodine is something I don't routinely prescribe iodine for estrogen metabolism. It's just an interesting thing that there's some studies that show there's higher rates of breast cancer with women with thyroid abnormalities. Now, we know that thyroid abnormalities, the bit, number one causes uh, iodine deficiency. And women with breast cancer tended to have lower, th uh, sorry, larger thyroid volume. So is there a connection there between iodine? So iodine supplementation in rats help ductal hyperplasia, okay? And patients with benign breast disease seem to improve. Now, a lot of the studies were done on iodine in prepubescent girls, because as they develop, go through thelarchy and develop breast tissue, they uptake a lot of iodine. And anecdotally, we know that breast cancer, and maybe in, in studies too, is lower in Japanese nations where they have high intake of iodine. Personally, I wouldn't prescribe iodine for the only reason of affecting estrogen metabolism because if you have too much iodine, you can cause a thyroid problem. All right, so it is actually easier to increase the 2-hydroxy pathway than it is to reduce the 4-hydroxy pathway. So when we're trying to affect estrogen metabolism, we can think about things to increase that 2-hydroxy pathway. So preventing that, if we increase CYP, we wanna also foster COMT, we wanna increase the quinone reductase, and we wanna increase glutathione con con conjugation. But we don't want to increase 1A, 1B1, right? We want to reduce that, reduce peroxidase, and we want to decrease beta-glucuronidase. Now, beta-glucuronidase is the enzyme that's produced in the gut. It's a higher significance when you have actually uh, bacterial overgrowth. So bifidobacteria significantly decreases glucuronidase activity. And so when we see that, if you've had a stool test, we would suggest giving calcium deglucurate which is an inhibitor of beta-glucuronidase. All right, so specifically looking at the urinary hormone results, when we get a Dutch test, you can see anything that's a negative is going to inhibit the enzyme. Anything that's positive is going to augment it. So what are the things? So there's a few things that are going to inhibit the 3A4. So those people that are eating grapefruit every day, drinking pomegranate juice every day, we don't necessarily want to inhibit that, you know, um, but the C, what we know, most normally do is we want to augment this 1B1. So we want to, I'm sorry, we want to inhibit that. We want to augment the 1A1. So normally what we will do to augment that is increase cruciferous veggies and DIMP. Or some people give I3C So and berries. So just dietary restrictions or actually giving DIMP because some of the studies saying that you have to eat like five pounds of broccoli a day to move that enzyme, the 1A1, okay? Now the 1B1, if we wanted to slow that down, here we got the grapefruit in here. So I don't know, I mean, you gotta take a choice. Uh, I don't know that I would recommend taking hops just to slow that down. A lot of times when we have SNPs in phase one, they're an upregulation. 
So the second phase is COMPT. Now we've had a lot of success actually manipulating the COMPT. And so you can see magnesium, B vitamins, SAMe, choline, all those things that are methyl donors can actually move that. And in my experience, having done these tests in a row, we do see that increase. We can see the percentage of red in the pie graph go down because of that. So that does, epigenetic modulation does work. And so if we look at the Dutch report, this is what I'm talking about. For those of you that might be new, that actually what we see is this is normal estrogen metabolism. We want most of it, 60 to 80% to be the green, the 1A1, the 2-hydroxy. This red here is the 4-hydroxy, okay? So that's this pathway here. So when I look at this test, I not only look at the pie graph and these percentages, I do look at the total estrogen load and the ratios, right? I don't really calculate a ratio per se, but the thing I like about how this report is easy to read is that there's dials. So you can just look, there's one here and one's over, you know, where are the notches on the dial? So if estrone is really high, as in this person, estradiol, really high, estriol, really high, obviously the amount of it is the same thing. Now, what happens if you see someone that has high in all of these? Does that mean you shouldn't give them estrogen? Well, it depends. So I have three kids, okay? Let's consider these three, my three kids. I have one kid, if I gave all my kids $100, my younger daughter is gonna save it all, okay? My older daughter is gonna spend $20 on herself and save $80. My son is probably gonna spend $80 on video games and lose the last 20. Now, does that mean that when I send him to college, I shouldn't give him any money? Not necessarily. He needs money, but I got to be careful about how I give it to him. Maybe I should give him Chipotle gift cards. Maybe I should give him gas cards and I shouldn't give him cash that he can use for video games, right? So that's the thing is people get scared about giving estrogen, but we just have to look to see what the metabolism is like, okay? So just real quick, uh, I want to make sure that I just go over my little DNA primer on genetics, okay? We know that genetics, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, a little base pair nucleotides, and two RNA strands that are joined. And so a SNP, or a single nu nucleotide polymorphism, is one base pair wrong. So we're not talking about a whole gene. We're not talking about a whole chromosome. We're talking about one base pair that is abnormal. So you got to be careful about it because these SNPs, there are some SNPs that are in non-coding regions that have no effect. There's some SNPs that are in promoting regions. So it depends on where the SNP is. So when your patients are doing things like 23andMe and they're reporting all the SNPs, there might be some SNPs that have no clinical consequence. So be a little careful about the direct-to-consumer genetic testing uh, because they're not always significant. So like I said, you have these causative SNPs and you have these that are outside of the genes. These are gonna have no effect on the protein function. You've got a regulatory sequence here. This may be non-coding. So maybe if there's a SNP, it changes the amount of protein where this is the coding and this changes the sequence. So it really depends on where in the gene the SNP is located. All right, so if you have person one who has AAATTT, -T -T, that's a normal protein. Person, T, a person two swaps out a T for an A. So now they might have a low amount of the protein. And person three has a C. So now not only do they have a low amount, but they have a misshapen protein. So when we're talking about hormones that work through a receptor, that's going to affect how it binds the receptor and affects the receptor. So that's where the SNPs come in. So... Think of it this way. Let's just say that my name is Joy, J-O-Y, and um, somebody thinks they're going to see Dr. J. Scott, J-A-Y, but somebody, instead of writing an A, writes an O. So I walk in and the patient says, oh, I thought I was gonna see Dr. J. Scott. One letter changed the meaning of the word, but I'm still a doctor, I can still help you, but your preconceived connotation with J-A-Y was a man. And now J-O-Y is a woman. So some SNPs change the meaning, but not necessarily the function. So if I said to you, are you coming to T-O-O or are you to coming T-W-O? If you heard me talk, you would understand what I meant. You wouldn't need to know if it was T-O-O or T-W-O. So there's some SNPs that make no consequence. 
they are alterations in genetics, but they don't mean anything. So there are some that are like that as well. And then there are some SNPs that all they do is they denote ethnicity. And so as when I'm teaching in Australia, they spell things differently. They say personalize with an S or color O-U, same as in London, whereas in the United States, we know we say color C-O-L-O-R. And funny, they spell estrogen O-E-S-T-R-O-G-N. So we can always tell where people are from sometimes by how they spell things. So those are some SNPs that that's how 23andMe denotes the ancestry because they can look at some of these SNPs and say, geographically, you're this percentage European, this percentage Hispanic, and so on. So the ones that we have to work up out for are the ones that totally change the meaning, as in C-U-T or C-A-T. That's still one letter, one base pair, but completely changes the meaning of the word. Doesn't make any sense now. If I said, did you let the cat out? Did you let the cut out? Or whatever, you'd have no idea what I was talking about. So there's a lot of variation on these SNPs, and with everything being direct to consumer, obviously, we, you may have to deal with some of these reports that your patients are bringing in. So we know that genetic inheritance is one gene variant from your mother, one from your father, and so heterozygote is one abnormal, homozygote is two abnormal, and wild type is the most common, which that always seemed like wild type should be wrong, but wild type is actually normal. So what are the genetic polymorphisms that we see in estrogen metabolism? Well, people often come in and they say, I have MTHFR. Or they might say something different, like I have that, you know, MTHFR gene. And so first of all, looking at just one SNP, there's a lot of MTHFR SNPs. 677 is one address. So if you looked at houses on a street, 677 would be the house number on the MTHFR street. And so we know that MTHFR is responsible for folate, but how does it specifically affect estrogen metabolism? Well, we know that um, it affects that, you know, the amount of folate also can affect, and there's some correlation between MTHFR and breast cancer, but we don't know. But here's the problem. Whoops, let me go back a slide. Here's the problem. This is methylation. It's not just MTHFR. It's a very complicated, lots of enzymes. So one enzyme, MTHFR, is here. And yes, that is in the neurotransmitter size, cycle, which the second phase is COMT right here, how dopamine gets rid of norepinephrine. But the problem is MTHFR is one thing, COMT is one thing. There's a lot of other enzymes that are very pertinent in this cycle. So I always try to point that out for patients is that it's not just MTHFR. You got to look at the whole thing if you're really concerned. But in specifically, when we're talking about estrogen metabolism, we do know that MTHFR peripherally does affect COMT but it's not a direct relationship. So the one that is more important in estrogen detoxification is COMT, so catechol methyl transferase. So that's phase two, that's the mopping of the floor. And so the, the one that has the most evidence is 158M. We also know that H62H and also 61 dash are the three uh, SNPs at COMT that have the most data behind it. So we know that reduced COMT activity, because it goes slower, would have more dopamine nor norepinephrine levels. And we also know that this is phase two for estrogen detoxification. And so it was explained to me by one of the genetic experts that for estrogen, even heterozygote is significant. For neurotransmitters, heterozygote may not be significant. But for estrogen, heterozygote is significant. All right, so when we're talking about COMT, we're talking about this second phase. So here's how we support it by B vitamins, magnesium, reducing stress, and also looking at glutathione. So when we talk about one of the other things that I like that we can kind of infer in the Dutch test is 19A1, 19A1A, CYP19. So this is one of the things that people don't look at. And actually one of my patients with breast cancer had a SNP here. And so she was shunting all of her testosterone into estrogen. So that is significant because remember this happens in the periphery. So it's not necessarily gonna be picked up in the serum testing. So when androgens are converted into estrogen and it's fast, you're dumping your testosterone into estrogen and that can account for it as well. So when we look at the 1B1, we talked about this. This is one that we see as an upregulation. So when you have a SNP at 1B1, that means your body prefers to go down the 1B pathway. Again, think about the three halls. 
It would be like if I went to the three halls at the high school and stood right at the beginning of the 1B hall and said, hey guys, come down my hall, here's a box of pizza. Of course, all the kids are gonna go towards the pizza, right? So that's 1B1, that's how your metabolites shut down that pathway if you have a SNP. And that makes it worse because guess what? Then you have more metabolites that are the four hydroxy. And if you don't neutralize those with methylation, that's a problem because it can go down that quinone pathway. It's kind of like this. Think about a highway. There are other things besides genetics that affect your enzymes. So traffic. Now, I don't know what it is like where you are, but here in Akron, Ohio, we don't have a problem with traffic too much. But if I look out at the highway and I see a backup, is it because there is a car accident? Is it because there's construction? Or in the winter, it could be because there's inches of snow slowing things down. So there are other things besides the SNPs that can affect these enzymes. So you don't wanna concentrate on the SNPs, you want an overall evaluation of how that's going. So I think that's what, when we're looking at the ratio of the Dutch test, that's what you're getting an assessment on, on that uh, the methylation index. So the agouti mice experiment, maybe you guys have heard of this, where they noticed that pregnant mice, the yellow ones, had high blood pressure and were obese. Now they knew it wasn't the yellow fur that caused that. So what they decided to do is they gave the yellow pregnant mice B vitamins in their chow. And what they found out is that the yellow pregnant mice could actually give birth to the brown mice that didn't have a problem with obesity and diabetes. So this shows that you can use epigenetic modulation. So this is really a fascinating experiment. So let's just, um, I don't know if I should pause for questions now or just go through the case study. We've got a little bit more time. Um, Can you hear me? I would say let's just keep going on, the, on to the case studies and we'll get to as many questions as we can. We've got a lot of good ones. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is a case. This is a patient of mine. Her name is changed for privacy, obviously. So Emma, she was a new patient and her main complaint was severe PMS and anxiety. And she had a lot of stress. She had three young children. The oldest was born prematurely at 28 weeks and had mild cerebral palsy. She had some problems with her feet and her ambulation. But Emma's main complaints were anxiety, poor sleep, and stress. And when she came to me initially, she was only on vitamin D and a multivitamin. And um, her family history was significant. Her sister had celiac disease and her mother had thyroid disease. So this is some serum testing that we did and kind of just running down. Um, PM cortisol is at 4 p.m. Um, I don't ever find serum testing super helpful when it comes to cortisol, but a lot of times we will draw it if that's what we're doing. Um, ferritin, um, that to me um, is a little on the lower side, but within the normal range. Progesterone, based on the lab that we had here, the normal is four to 28. And I was always taught by my infertility professors that anything over 10 signifies a good ovulation, so that's okay. Her T3 was 2.8. Her DHEAS was high. Now she wasn't taking any and her vitamin D was low. Her TSH was kind of right in the middle, 2.08, T4, one. So that was a little bit below the halfway mark, but still within normal limit. Pregnenolone, sometimes I find that to be helpful, but it seems like if it's really high or really low, it's helpful, but we don't have any normal values. And some labs just give a ceiling normal limit. They don't give a bottom normal limit. So I don't know that it, I mean, sometimes it helps you if it's really low, but pregnenolone, remember, is a metabolite that is very quickly got moving downstream. Uh, dihydrotestosterone, for someone her age, you know, she's in her 30s, is pretty low, 4 to 22 is normal. Her TIBC was okay. Her iron saturation was okay. We went ahead and ran her labs for celiac, which were negative. All right, so the first thing that we did is we did a salivary report on her. So when you look at these, um, I, we're looking at the mid luteal, so 2.8 to 8.2. So seven is at the higher end. You're talking about maybe 80th percentile. Her, est her estrone, again, now this is a young girl who was thin. I think she was like 5'4", 125 pounds. So I wouldn't expect her to have a high estrone based on her body fat. I mean, so it's not coming from excess aromatization and fat tissue, but this, you can see that 
her estrone is 75th percentile. And then we have our estriol, which is 80. Again, this particular lab, all it gives us is a ceiling value. So I've noticed that a lot of times if it's over 70 for this lab, that is significant. Now here, I think it's a little odd that somebody at her age has a very low testosterone. Her progesterone, you can see, uh, in luteal phase was within the norm limits, as was her ratio. So if you look at this, you say, okay, well, everything must be normal, right? Because everything's pretty much in the normal limits. This was her cortisol. Uh, so her cortisol was high normal the whole day, and her DHEA was high in the saliva as it was in the serum. So we focused on her adrenal gland and, you know, her main complaint was PMS though, right? So that was something that was a specific cyclical complaint. So uh, I told her, you know, you need to start doing yoga. And she actually went on to become a certified yoga teacher and did yoga three days a week, which is great. So then uh, she came back and because she had symptoms with her cycles, we decided to give her progesterone. Even though her progesterone level was okay, it was at the lower quartile where her estrogens or at the higher quartile. So remember, they were within normal limits, but one was down at 25th percentile and one was high at 75th percentile. We replaced her low vitamin D and we gave her some adaptogens. So she then came in the next year and actually did run a genomics panel. So again, 1A2, that's phase one. This was higher inducibility. So normal metabolizer means that it is normal, but it could be induced. Now here's her COMT, that's phase two. That's heterozygote, so it's valmet. So that means it's a little slower. Okay, we've got C19, that's normal. That's the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. Okay, we've got 3A4, 3A5. So those are ones that metabolize drugs that are also involved in creating estriol. And then we've got, she's got MTHFR at 677, okay? So she does have a COMT SNP. So when she came back, we did serum labs, okay? Now here are the normal ranges. Her estrone within normal limits, her estradiol, not that interesting. Her DHEA came back high again. Her total testosterone and her free testosterone, again, kind of unremarkable. And so one of the reasons I wanted to put this in here is because now we've had serum labs that are unremarkable. We've had saliva, lab, uh, saliva labs that are kind of also unremarkable because for her, the issue is her estrogen metabolism. So clearly a urine metabolites is gonna be a little bit better measurement. So she also had done some stool results in which we saw that she had some digestive issues. So we decided to change her method of progesterone into a troche. So finally got her to do the Dutch testing. Now, again, you have to be intentional on how you, what you do with the patient. There, I don't know that there's necessarily a right answer, um, but for me, you have to either decide, are you gonna test the patient on nothing that cycle? So are you gonna stop everything? Are you gonna hold it prior to? now? The, the instructions are to hold DHEA, which she's not on for three days. The instructions are to do the first two collections and then take your progesterone. Now, depending on the mode of, um, the mode of administration, whether it's oral, topical, or trochee, it's going to make a difference in your results. So she has a trochee. Anything orally, 90% of that is gonna be excreted, right? So you have to decide how you're gonna interpret these. So for her, I wanted to look at her estrogen metabolism. And yeah, I know her, her progesterone is gonna be a little bit skewed high because she's taking a trochee and it's just gonna push it right out in her urine. So her estradiol, this is 50th percentile, is a little high. Her progesterone, very high because she was treated. Here's her testosterone. So this is her summary sheet. You get a summary of her adrenal hormones. So if we look in a little bit more detail, excuse my like cut and paste here. We wanna look at progesterone and the alpha and the beta. And there are some studies, which I forgot to review them. I know uh, Mark uh, Newman sent me a lot of studies about there is significant whether you're alpha when, it can turn, when it's concerning progesterone and proliferation. So we look at that and then we look at her DHEAS. So her DHEAS is showing that it's high here. And I love the way this actually gives you an age-related thing. So there's two things I feel that are really helpful about this particular test. One, the alpha and the beta is really helpful because the alpha is the pathway that's gonna go down the dihydrotestosterone. So some people, when they have androgens, are gonna have 
shunting to 5-alpha get a lot of acne. Some people are gonna prefer the 5-beta as this patient, so acne may not be an issue. So to me, I find this reading really helpful. Down here where you see the age-dependent ranges, I find that extremely helpful because again, there's a huge range for DHEAS, there's a huge range for testosterone, and having a more tight range for age is really helpful. So I always pay attention to that. So this is what we really wanted to know for her. We really wanted to know her estrogen metabolism. So again, here's her estrone. Okay, so that's not super high as we saw in her saliva. Um, her estradiol was on the higher end and her estriol wasn't. But if we look at her, the way her metabolite is, and if we look at this, we uh, on first glance, we say, oh, that's good because she's got most of it going down the 1A1 one, one pathway, right? And so we also knew that she had a 3A4 SNP, right? So in her 1B1, we look at the percentages. So she's got 86% of green, great. She's got 6.7% of red, good. We don't want a high percentage of that. And then she's got this 6.5. So most of it's going down this 1B1 pathway, whoops. Um, and then the problem is we know she has a SNP at COMT, right? So she's got a high amount here and a low amount here. And so that's the methylation activity. So in this patient, the actual value of estrogen wasn't helping us. The value of progesterone wasn't helping us. It was the problem with her is the problem with her estrogen metabolism. That was what was contributing to her symptoms. So I, that's why I feel like this, this test was extremely helpful for this particular patient. The other issue, as you can see, is she has issues with her adrenal gland. Now her total DHEA production, you can see here, is at the higher end. We saw that in saliva and um, uh, uh, serum for her. So all three values agree that she had higher DHEA levels. But if you look at her free cortisol in her urine, kind of low, okay, a little on the low side, and then even lower as far as cortisone. So her body, you know, obviously is um, showing that she has the correct curve, but she has some lower values throughout the day. And so we did kind of know, based on the fact that when she first came to see me that she really wasn't sleeping. So this is extremely helpful part of the test as well. Now this bonus is probably one of my favorite things that I love about this test is you also, someone like me who's interested in estrogen detoxification and methylation, you also get these organic acids. So you get your B12 marker. And so this is above range. So you can see we need B12 for her BHMT, we needed to run her methyl cycle. Her B6, which you need for her um, sulfation, it seems to be normal. And her pyroglutamate, remember that's that back door for estrogen metabolism to get those harmful 4-hydroxy metabolites out if they go down that quinone pathway. So we can see here, hers is okay. Um, I like that it gives us a neurotransmitter metabolite. So if someone's anxious, it gives us a little bit. I mean, there's some people who don't believe that is uh, reflective of neurotransmitter status in the brain, but I find it to be helpful information. So dopamine, obviously, and uh, norepinephrine were in normal limits. Her melatonin was here. And this 8-OHDG, especially in today's day and age, I think it's helpful because it's a measurement of oxidative stress, which is the hallmark of chronic diseases. So for this patient, she looks pretty good as far as her organic acids. So knowing that, um, you know, she, you know, progesterone, so we have to be careful if we're really trying to look at dosage, right? Because 90% of what you give orally or what you give uh, buccally or sublingually is going to be in the urine. So either we have to decide that we're going to adjust for that or we're going to go by her clinical scenario. And so I am extremely fascinated in all the different types of testing and how they measure different types of hormones. And I'm also a firm believer that lab testing is only one of the components, right? You gotta to listen to the patient. What does she say? And what's her clinical scenario? What were her periods like? What were her symptoms like? So in this patient, we know that the big issue is her adrenal support, obviously, and her methylation. So now we can think about some things to support that comp enzyme for her. Um, so basically that's the end of my presentation. So we have some time for questions, but my point is, is that I feel that we underutilize estrogen metabolism. And so there are, um, and maybe we'll talk about in the future of the link with breast cancer. We do a great job saying you have this, uh, lipid profile, 
you have this cholesterol, it equals this risk for cardiovascular. But we're not doing the same thing for breast and uterine cancer. So I feel like this side helps identify a higher risk patient that you can continue to follow. I'm going to continue to follow this patient as far as her risk for breast cancer. Again, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that how genetics help with estrogen detoxification. Remember that highway. You might have a SNP, but remember what is the other factors called epigenetics. Just because you have a SNP doesn't mean you're going to have X percentage activity at that enzyme. If you haven't read Dr. Ben Lynch's Dirty Genes book, it's fantastic. And it talks about what are all the things you can do epigenetic-wise to modulate this. And so we've shown in our patient population that it works, that we're able to move those percentages. We're able to shift those percentages of red to decrease that down. And so this test is one of my favorite tests because I feel like it not only gives you a good read on your adrenals, whether you're somebody that's converting cortisol to cortisone, it gives you the organic acids and also gives you the breakdown of the estrogen metabolites. All right, I think that's my last slide. Just like, you know, any other questions, you guys can always follow me on social media. Um, I'm trying to do a lot of content on there as well. Um, I thought there was one more slide. Um, but as always, uh, reach out to Amy if you are not using the Dutch test. I would strongly suggest it as, as part of your monitoring of hormonal patients. Great, thank you. Um, so let me just dive in on some questions, and we've got a lot, and I know we won't get to everyone, so um, we'll do our very best here. Um, a lot of you gave uh, situationals for certain patients that you have, so we'll just dive right in. Um, I've got uh, one clinician that's asking, um, he has a female patient with estrogen dominance and testosterone dominance. Um, do you know of any reason why DHEA might be very high? Is there any concern about DHEA being very high with no other signs, symptoms of adrenal tumor or pituitary tumor? And do you have any advice on how to reduce DHEA uh, safely if necessary? So those are all great questions. And when you're, if you haven't already looked at the Dutch test, I think you're assuming that those are high in the Dutch test. I'm interested specifically on the five alpha and the five beta metabolism of androgens. So I'd be interested to know, does that patient also have a high DHT? Um, so we can see the 5-alpha and 5-beta with the Dutch test. Um, if someone has testosterone dominance, a lot of times if they're estrogen dominance, testosterone is metabolized the same way as estrogen. So I'd be interested, how is their methylation? How is their estrogen detoxification? Uh, as far as is what, why would DHEA be high? So I see it high for a couple of reasons. One, I do see it high just familially, I don't know if it's ethnicity, but I have a lot of girls and sisters and mothers that it runs in their family that they just have a high DHEA. We also see high androgens, obviously, in PCOS. So I'm wondering, that's one of the hallmarks for PCOS, anovulation, high androgens. And I see it go up with stress. And so being an OBGYN, I, I have the luxury of working with patients from teens on through many phases of their life. So I've seen it go up when it's previously been low. So I don't know if your patient has always been high in DHEA. Um, I would work on obviously the DHEA cortisol ratio and stress balancing. And also I'd be very interested to see how her 5-alpha and 5-beta is and her estrogen detoxification. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so this is gonna be a broad question that I, I think you'll like. Um, how would you approach hormone replacement for postmenopausal females with history of blood clots? Okay, so great question. So if you look at the data from the WHI, it showed there was an increased risk of blood clots with oral estrogen and uh, CEE. But if you look at the Canonico meta-analysis, which was published in 2008, Marianne Canonico, she did a meta-analysis that looked at 17 different studies. There were and don't quote me exactly, it was like nine observational studies and eight randomized placebo control trials, but 17 different studies. And all of them showed that the relative risk of uh, VTE was higher with oral versus transdermal. So I currently, I, I make it, uh, for me, my practice pattern is I don't prescribe oral estrogen. I do have patients who either have a history of a blood clot or have factor five mutation that I'm safely treating with transdermal estrogen. 
Now, again, the amount needs to be monitored. The estrogen metabolism, need, metabolism needs to be monitored because, again, estrogen in excess isn't going to be good for that patient that has a history of thrombophilia. But I do give transdermal either gel or patch or cream to patients that have had with correct, uh, proper consent and proper monitoring. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't think you touched on this. I have a question here on how much NAC does a woman need to reduce breast cancer? Or what do you typically, I guess, um, have them take? So usually I would prescribe 500 of NAC twice a day. And it depends on if they have really high 4-hydroxy, I might give them to them twice a day to start. And like I said, we've watched the needle move on these estrogen metabolism tests, so it does work. So it's kind of like New Orleans after Katrina, right? There's phase one, which is getting rid of the flood, right? And phase two, fixing the levee in the pipes, right? So in the beginning, when they have a lot, you probably want to give 500 twice a day. For maintenance, if the pipes are working and the metabolism is fixed, you could probably give 500 once a day. And again, that's going to be a precursor to glutathione. So getting that in balance also is going to help fix, fix the pipes. Great. Um, okay, I've got uh, a question here. Do you see high 4-OH or 16-OH levels relating to other cancers or other system problems such as colon cancer, cardiovascular disease? So I see the 4-hydroxy, it's been documented in estrogen and breast cancer. The only other hormone sensitive cancer that I'm aware of is melanoma. Um, I don't know that there's ever been a study looking at the estrogen metabolites and cancer. And so I actually just did a literature search looking at the metabolites and cancers. There's really not a lot of data on those studies because people just aren't looking at that. Um, as far as colon cancer, that's one of the ones that is on that BRCA gene but not traditionally hormone sensitive. As far as I know, I'm not aware of a study that shows that. So it's a great question. It'd be something that maybe I, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of a study, but I can't say I've specifically searched that except for the breast and uterine cancer. Okay, great. Um, is there a maximum safe amount of DIM and what would adverse effects be besides possible GI discomfort in some folks? taking DIM? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know a while back, people were saying you needed to give a ratio of I3C and DIM, or you need to just give DIM. Those studies have kind of come to pass. Normally, I'm just giving DIM 100 milligrams. And again, I'm looking at how is it affecting it? I don't know if there's a benefit to giving 200. I've only ever given 100 because we're looking at other paths in estrogen detoxification. And I agree with you that GI distress is probably the biggest side effect. Very rarely I have these patients that say that if their estrogen drops too much, that they're symptomatic. I don't know if that's really the DIM because remember, it's just passing that 1A1 pathway. It's not, and the 1A1 pathway is happening after it's already been in the serum. It's not happening before it gets to the serum. So those are the only side effects that I'm aware of. Great. Okay. I've got, um, how does estrogen affect levels of uh, thyroxine binding globulin? Okay. Another great question and a thing that we uh, a lot of times don't pay attention to. Any estrogen in excess is going to increase binding proteins. Any estrogen given orally is going to, is going to go through the liver and not only increase the clotting factors, but increase any binding factor. So thyroid binding globulin, sex hormone binding globulin, cortisol binding globulin. So when you give estrogen orally in the form of an oral contraceptive, in the form of CEE, it's going to increase your thyroid binding globulin, thus decreasing your free T4 and free T3. Now, I, if you're giving estrogen transdermally, it's going, it's going to bypass the liver, but if you have an excess amount, any high estrogen is going to drive up those binding proteins. So yes, when you check your thyroid, I always do the free levels, and anyone who's estrogen dominant, it's going to affect their thyroid, just as you mentioned that. Great, so um, I've got a question here. Can um, plan B pills cause issues with estrogen in the rest of the body? So plan B is levonorgestrel, and so what the thought is, is that if you give a high-dose progesterone, you're gonna interrupt ovulation. So patient has unprotected intercourse, 
if they're theoretically before their ovulation, if you give high dose, 12 hours apart, leave an adjustral, that progestin is going to prevent ovulation. So it's not a progesterone. So a lot of women do have an affected cycle because it's you give it and then 12 hours later, you're supposed to give it again. Um, and so that higher dose progestin can defer ovulation, can compete at the binding site with your normal progesterone too, which is going to enhance estrogen dominance. So the question was, what was the question about estrogen? How can it affect estrogen? I think it's gonna, it, it potentially could increase estrogen by blocking the action of progesterone. Great, okay, let me, um, still scrolling through here. Um, what does it mean if the, the pyroglutamate on the Dutch test shows a high end on the range? So the way I understand the, um, the metabolite is if it's high or low, it means that you could be deficient in glutathione. So glutathione is produced by GSH. Um, there's a couple enzymes that you could have SNPs that produce it. So is it deficient because you have a high need for it? Is it deficient because you have a genetic SNP that you don't produce it? So generally we treat that. And so I always give the patient either the option of taking liposomal glutathione and my favorite brands are, um, I love Apex's trisomal glutathione. I also, I think that tastes better probably than Designs for Health, liposomal glutathione, or the NAC. So if they have a high 4-hydroxy, you know, you could just give them the NAC, which will boost, will, which will handle that 4-hydroxy, boost their glutathione. There also are some B complexes, one from uh, Metagenics Methylcare that has the NAC in it along with the B vitamin. So that, that is a great supplement to use in that instance also. Terrific. Um, let's see. I think that might be just about it. Hang on here. Let me. So I know someone's got a question here. Does the Dutch test also give SNPs, which we don't currently? Um, is there any particular test that you typically use, Dr. Scott? For genetics? Yeah. You know what? That, huh. So right now I'm using I'm using Max Gen. Genova has a really good one, but it's super expensive. They have a really good, uh, I think it's called Estrogenomics, um, but it's crazy expensive. I, don't quote me on the price. I think it's like $500. Max Gen, the whole test, which does hit most of the pathways. I've been trying to get them to add the 19, the CYP19, because I think that's really important for estrogen. But they, as of just a couple months ago, they hadn't added it. But MaxGen is like 249, and it has a pretty good assessment um, of estrogen metabolism, some dietary preferences, some histamine genes. So it's a pretty good one. Um, so those are the main ones that I'm currently using. Okay, so I'm, I've got two more things. One here: um, Does phytoestrogen, such as um, isoflavone, have any effect on estrogen modulation in postmenopausal women with estrogen, um, I think estrogen only made in the adrenals? So the estrogen made in the adrenal is gonna be via DHEA, but remember it's not actually made in the adrenal, it's in the muscle and fat, DHEA through androstenedione dione is converted to estrone. So that's happening in the periphery. The way I understand phytoestrogen is they are competing at the receptor site. So you have a receptor. I showed you that study of the alpha and the beta receptor. They're going to occupy the receptor, kind of like musical chairs, and they're going to either agonize or antagonize. So when we have things like phytoestrogen, some of them will actually turn it on and act like estrogen, and then you have some that are going to not, not or they're going to antagonize at the receptor. So it shouldn't affect estrogen metabolism. And as far as postmenopausal, is it gonna help the relief? I will tell you that a lot of my patients that have hot flashes, it's not always because of low estrogen. It could be because their estrogen is okay and they have low progesterone, or it could be because of low DHE and low adrenal function. So sometimes it does provide relief, but again, you know, us in functional medicine, we wanna to get to the root cause of what is the abnormality. Okay. Um, would sublingual progesterone be better for those with PCOS and preference for an androgenic pathway? 
And would progesterone be contraindicated with someone with COMT and high estrone? Okay, so the first part of the question is, would a progesterone sublingual in a trochee form be better for someone with PCOS? So the with a preference for androgenic pathway, yeah. Okay, so um, so the hallmark of PCOS obviously is high androgens. So mm -hmm. if progesterone is five alpha, you know, as far as I know, it's it's still it's going to be five alpha for allopregnenolone, not necessarily for five alpha uh, for dihydrotestosterone. They're already going to have high androgens. In general, for P people with PCOS are estrogen dominant, so I use it all the time. The thing that makes me determine, should I give them oral, transdermal, and uh, trochee, first of all, a little bit is price and preference, and if they have a bad gut. If they have a bad gut, you know that oral micronized progesterone that's commercially available is in peanut oil most of the time, or it's not slow release, it's immediate release. So it's just dumped, so a lot of people can't absorb it that well. Um, so in patients that don't absorb it that well and prefer to use something that they, you know, they can just... Um, dissolve, the trochees are good. The second part of the question was estrogen metabolism in PCOS. What was the second part? No, it was would progesterone be contraindicated with someone with uh, COMT and high estrone? So no, it would actually be needed because someone with COMT is going to have slow estrogen detoxification in phase two of methylation, okay? And so they're going to be estrogen dominant. And so we know that progesterone down regulates the estrogen receptor. Remember those references I gave from Spiroff's from our textbook. So we know that progesterone inhibits the estrogen upregulation of RNA and oncogenesis. So absolutely, those girls are at risk of endometrial cancer. And if you follow it out, at risk of breast cancer because they're estrogen dominant. So that's exactly the type of patient you want to give micronized progesterone, not progestin, micronized progesterone too. Okay, so that's going to be our last um, last question. One thing a lot of you asked here at the end uh, to rename the, the book that you recommended, and that was um, Dirty Genes by Dr. Ben Lynch. So hopefully everybody got that, and we'll, we'll try to include that in our email follow-up tomorrow when we send everybody out the recording, which we will send you the replay. Um, we will send you a copy of the slides as well. So thank you, Dr. Scott, for being with us. Um, everyone who's still on with us, uh, join us in August. Um, we will be doing just a Q&A format with Dr. Jones and Dr. Rice. Um, we're going to ask you to send questions in ahead of time. Um, so I think that'll be a really great interactive uh, one hour of lots of questions and answers. And then um, come back and join us in October. I believe it was October 14th. We've got Dr. Scott scheduled again, and she will be talking um, breast cancer. So uh, probably hitting up, talking about estrogen metabolism a lot again. So thank you again. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.